everyone. Thank you so much uh, for coming out today. Just uh, a couple of uh, just housekeeping notes and just general. We want your stay, or your very short stay with us to be as hospital as possible. So if you ever uh, need to excuse yourself for the restroom, just go out the doors, turn left and take another left, and the restroom's right there. Uh, we have a ton of food left over um, from the luncheon today, um, so please help yourself. If you need a snack midway through the program, you know where the table is, so help yourself to that. Uh, we got a ton of waters and Cokes, so please, um, if you get thirsty, help yourself. We do ask uh, with the Cokes, though, you're welcome to bring some water in here, but uh, be careful with the Cokes. If you have to come bring one in to sit down for medical issues, please uh, do so. Um, but uh, other than that, if you could take out the sugar drinks and keep those out in the hallway, that would be wonderful. But um, we're so excited for this event today. I have some more things to say about that later. But I just wanted to introduce Miss Tammy Chapman um, today. She's got two selections that she's going to perform for us today. I know you're going to be thrilled uh, to hear her sing. So without further ado, here's Miss Tammy Chapman. We must never forget the past, the cost it took to change it, and the cost it will take to improve our future and the future of our children's of our children. Today, you will learn about Juneteenth, which is June 19, 1865, the day enslaved blacks in Texas learned of their freedom two and a half years after the fact of their independence from the bondage of slavery. This historical travesty like many others, is unknown and must not be hidden, unspoken, or forgotten. All history, good and bad, must be remembered, recorded, and taught to our children. We must never hide or forget our past. George Santana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it.
are not afraid. We are not afraid. We are not afraid today. Oh, deep in my heart, I My next song was written and performed by Sam Cooke in 1964. This song expresses, expresses plaintive aspirational optimism by being the ultimate song of hope over despair with its eloquent depiction of triumph over diversity. It became the unofficial anthem that embodied the struggle of minorities of the civil rights movement in America. It provides words of encouragement to each generation to keep striving toward progress in the face of adversity. The song expresses the lifelong struggles of discrimination and racism as hard burdens to bear. However, there is hope as Cook self-assures that a change is going to come. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 16, scripture reminds us that heaven's value system is far di different from Earth's value system. In verse 16 it says, So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. I was born by the river in a little tent, oh, just like the river I've been running ever since. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die. Cause I don't know what's up there on this sky. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know. Change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. I go to the movie and I go downtown. Somebody keep telling me, don't you hang around? It's been a long, long time coming. But I know change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Then I grow 
to my brother and I say, brother, help me please. But he winds up knocking me back down on my knees. And oh, there's been times that I thought that I couldn't last so long. But now I think I'm able It's been a long, long time coming, but I know change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. God knows it will. <laughs> Thank you. Isn't she phenomenal? Let's give her another round of applause. You can make some noise if you want. You can take it. Uh, I made some noise too, sir. So they were uh, a humongous uh, help in planning. 
and I'll talk more about that here shortly. But um, the Southeast uh, Office of Marketing, Public Relations, and Strategic Communications, Amy Simpson, Sean Land, and Dakota Saylor are vital to the success of this. I can't put together a PowerPoint, let alone pictures, and so they have done a phenomenal job in promoting this event. Um, the IT department at Southeast, Merle Galloway, Chris Washington, and Chick Karuba. Um, uh, like I said, the student walked by, as I was in Chris offices, and they are like, uh, this student needs to help with the email. I'm like, I can't even work on the computer, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll wait until Chris gets back here. But uh, uh, Ben and M for, um, for, um, for, for the meal, they provided the meal today uh, for us. Uh, ARH Hospital, uh, specifically Mark Bell, uh, they donated all of the drinks that you have today. Uh, and the Southeast Educational Foundation, they also helped support with the drinks. So uh, let's give them a round of applause for all of our folks. spend a short amount of time today reintroducing the college to you and exploring ways we hope the community will partner and use the college's facilities and resources for positive and productive work, which we hope will ultimately, ultimately, ultimately lead to growth and prosperity for our region. But first, I'd like to take a moment and introduce our recently formed Executive Diversity Committee. The committee encompasses the entire college and will have a strong presence on each, each of our campuses. Dr. Adams' vision for the committee is to bridge and spread the, uh, to bridge the shared work of the diversity and inclusion uh, for each campus, so that we may streamline and better communicate our work more effectively to have the greatest impact on our students, colleagues, and community. Here are the members of the executive committee. For the Cumberland campus, and I'll talk more about this here shortly, um, the, the diversity chairs uh, for the Cumberland campus are Tammy Chapman and Brandon Gent. Uh, for the Knox County campus, we're having we're, uh, we're opening a new campus uh, in Barberville um, this year. We're very excited about that. And uh, Ms. Sherry Tinsley will lead the efforts of diversity there. Uh, Heartland campus is Chris Washington and Erica Farmer. Middlesbrough is Jamie Jones. Whitesburg campus, Keisha Hunt Erie. And we're so excited that uh, Dr. Adams wanted to have uh, some administrators on the, uh, the community as well, because this is truly a shared work. This is not a one-person job. Dr. Rebecca Johnson, Dr. Aaron Razor, Carrie Billett, and Dr. Rick Mason. And so, uh, uh, like I said, uh, this is our new Executive Diversity Committee uh, for the college. Now, why is this important? Because this is who we hope you will partner with for this work that we're gonna talk about today. We're looking for the community to help guide us through this. Um, these challenges and these, um, these hurdles, which are, that you all know more about than I could ever experience or even hope to, to know, uh, we need help. We need help to identify what the needs are and so that we can best serve you. And so, like I said, we'll have a diversity committee on each campus, and each of these uh, campus chairs will lead that committee. So if you want to be a part of one of these committees in your hometown, on your home, on your home turf, please uh, reach out to me, Rylan Pope, or one of the, the the names that you see there. We want to be involved uh, desperately, but we need help uh, understanding what the work is and identifying those needs. We can't do that without you. This is truly a community effort. Um, this is not a one-person game. Um, as we look uh, for community partners to help host and facilitate this program today, it was the vision of Dr. Tony Sweat to have an open community discussion on the current needs of our people, specifically the needs of the African American communities in our region. We are grateful for each of you who are present today to make this vision a reality. We hope and encourage each of you to participate in the upcoming discussion and to be open and honest about the realities of living in today's rural Appalachia. We're here to listen, not lecture, not preach, and definitely not offer a false or shallow solution to any of the needs you present today without first engaging, engaging in thoughtful dialogue and, uh, and, uh, and time to develop a realistic plan to serve those needs to the best of our abilities. We truly want to hear from you, so please allow us the opportunity to listen 
and learn the best ways to serve each of you today. So be encouraged, be encouraged to speak up and speak out. You have permission. With all that said, please allow me to begin to share the stage for today's program. And let me begin to reintroduce Southeast Kentucky Community and Technical College to you. So uh, those colleagues of mine who are going to present and know who you are, if you can make your way uh, to the stage. Um, the higher ground folks, if you want, you're towards the end of the, uh, the presentation here. Uh, I can get you on stage here shortly. But uh, we'll uh, pass the mic around, so I want to get the... We haven't rehearsed this, so everyone's going off of the cuff here. So this is truly an improv uh, production here. But um, like I said, we want to reintroduce the college to you all so that we can show you all the resources and the facilities that are available to you, the community. We are honestly here to serve you. We're not here to, uh, to take or we're not here to, um, to try to service our own needs. Our needs as a college are your needs. We are a community college. Um, and so we have to, in order for us to be successful, we have to know what the work is. Um, so as, uh, as you, we're just gonna do a, a slight presentation on what the college is and what we offer. And so you're gonna hear about our programs and the facilities on each program. So everyone knows when you go to college, there's degrees. Well, there's academics and technicals, which we'll talk a little bit about. This is uh, the academic side of things. Um, we have uh, two specific degrees, arts and then a science degrees. And if I'm wrong about this, somebody come correct me when you speak. But uh, the main thing that Ms. Uh, Peggy Conklin, uh, our Dean uh, of Arts and Sciences, wanted me to share with you all today is the terms. The community has multiple opportunities to enroll in classes. It does not start in August uh, and January anymore. There, we, we have evolved to best serve you all. And so we offer these structured terms for the fall, spring, and summer. There are uh, three week mini terms in May and December where you can get a class, a three credit hour class done in three weeks. It's intense, it's insane, uh, but you, you're finished. And so for those who uh, that class is necessary within the time limits, um, uh, please spread the word about that. This is, we're showing you this stuff to, 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 to help you understand on what, how you can take advantage of our infrastructure. Uh, we offer uh, different term structures. We have a five week term, an eight week term, a 12 week term, and a 16 weeks. Now, not every class is offered within these terms, but if there's a, something that's in to, going towards your degree and it fits within it, any of those terms within the fall or spring, you can hop on board and take that class right there. We're trying to best serve you, and this is why we're offering a plethora of different opportunities to enroll and get the credit you need towards your degree. Look, time, that's the only thing we all share in this world, is the time. And so we're offering you the opportunity for the public to best manage and to take advantage of that time to get a degree. Not all degrees or the path to degrees take uh, two and a half years or two years anymore. You can get a degree in a sh uh, half of the time what it used to normally take. So I'm going to pass the mic over to Dr. Erin Razor here. She'll talk to you about the technical programs. Thank you, Rylan. Um, as he's also mentioned about the, uh, the term lengths, we have a lot of our technical programs that fit in that, and some of them are particularly online. And five of those are in the five-week sessions. And I'll start with those. Those are computers, uh, business administration, education, uh, criminal justice. Let's see, is that four or five? I think it's four. Criminal justice, education, business, CIT. Maybe it's just four. But Ms. Uh, Chapman also teaches in those, uh, the five-week structure. So that also helps our students to, if you want to start a little bit later, then you have that opportunity to jump in and start and you don't have to, to wait for your, your set time. But our programs are also dispersed. So it's, it's very unique, um, I'll say, in, in the offerings we have and every campus has its own climate. So on this campus is more of our technical and it's more the, uh, the hands-on industrial type. So we have our, uh, our automotive, our welding, our HVAC, um, and what uh, computer
computerized machine manufacturing, medical assisting, education of course is here. And then we, we go on to our other campuses and you're gonna see a lot of these offered um, on the multiple campuses, but our Pineville especially is where our allied health is settled. And that's where you're gonna have um, our physical, uh, not our physical therapy, physical therapy is Whitesburg, but our radiography, our respiratory, our surge tech, which you can get in 10 months. Um, a telehealth is something that is very, very new. We're excited to be promoting it this year, and it's rolling out in the fall semester. It's going to be one semester, and it's a 16-credit hour certificate. So that is brand new, and uh, we're extremely excited to be offering that to the communities. Um, you can see the rest of the list of the, the programs, and uh, we're, I believe this is going to be later on in the program with Knox Campus. So I don't want to steal anybody's thunder, but we'll also be having uh, more of the industrial type programs on our Knox, Knox campus as well. One other um, certificate that's up here, or that's, that's, we have that's not been mentioned, is our aviation. And that is on the Middlesboro campus. So it is a certificate and it is Private Pilot Ground School. So if you know of anyone interested in that, they can always uh, begin their, their education and training to, 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 to become a pilot. So I think that's about it for the, the technical programs and also 3D printing in Middlesboro in our idea center. So it's really neat. If you have an idea you'd like to create, you can contact him and he can make that happen for you. But that's, that's all the programs I have. I'm Heather Lewis. I'm the dual credit coordinator here at Southeast. And dual credit is simply taking a college class while you're in high school. And it started out kind of small, you know, some would take a couple classes, and we do have students now that actually graduate high school with their associate degree as well. And there are scholarships available for high school students. They are available through Kia, but they have to talk to their guidance counselor to see if they're eligible for those. And dual credit saves you on tuition, it saves you, saves time spent on the pursuit of a college degree, and you receive exposure to different paths that you might be interested in, and it increases your chances of even completing a college degree. And dual credit courses are offered here at the college, they're offered online, they're offered at the, offered at the local high schools, and at the area technology centers. And then here are the high schools that participate in its Appalachian Challenge Academy, Bell County High School, Laurel County Center for Innovation, Harlan County High School, Harlan High School, Jenkins High School, Knox Central High School, Letcher County Central, Lean Camp, Middlesboro, Pineville, Bell, Knox, and Letcher Area Technology Centers. I'm so thankful to have partnerships with every one of those. Um, but that's just a little bit about dual credit. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Erin. Um, so now, we're going to talk about our facilities. So those are some basic, uh, uh, general outline of the programs that we offer um, for support. If your kid's not enrolled in dual credit, uh, wh what are you doing? Uh, they can get college credit today while they're in school. And there's multiple uh, sources of, well, through uh, KHEAA, you can get scholarships. So. Uh, please take advantage of that opportunity. So, um, and there can't, the, the, the instructors are local. You're going through us. If you need to reach out to your professor, you know how to find us. So uh, please enroll, uh, enroll in dual credit. So I'd like to welcome Lige to the stage uh, for our campus sites. Uh, before he makes it up here, this is just, you, you all can reserve rooms here. This specific location and everywhere else, those are examples of the different possibilities of what uh, could happen here on campus. And this would be the form, it's online, don't stress, that you can fill out right there, and that's how you reserve a room. So we'll go into more detail about this. There is a video live, so let me make sure that sounds not on the video. All right. Thank you, Riley. Sam Cook. I'll tell you what, I'll be humming that song all day today, I believe. So I uh, really appreciate that, Tammy. Again, my name is Elijah Buell. I'm the campus director for the Harlan campus and also for the Cumberland campus. And as Ryan has mentioned, you know, we, we have facilities and, and our community uh, uses our facilities. Before the pandemic, uh, we had, like I said, birthday parties, wedding showers, baby showers in our uh, gallery, in our, uh, our porch area. On the Harlan campus here, uh, it's a, basically in our break room. And 
we use the auditorium here and, and a couple of the classrooms for different activities also. But uh, the Harlan campus, again, we have four buildings. Uh, you know, the, the ad building, as we call it, uh, houses our administration uh, facilities along with the medical assisting and uh, uh, certified uh, nursing and certificate. Uh, we also have uh, HVAC and uh, our uh, student services, which is very important in our particular area anyway. And also you have the business office. Uh, we also have what we call Building One, that's where you're at, the, the, the Harlan Tech Building. It's very important to us because it houses our carpentry, our uh, CNC uh, program, and, and also our welding program. Uh, we have a lot of events in our auditorium that we, that we host and also we sponsor. Uh, the mining building, we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, the Kentucky Mining Minerals that uh, are housed in that facility. Uh, also, we have our automobile uh, uh, technology program, which is very good. We, we have some outsta an outstanding instructor that's, in, that's part of that program also. Uh, something that you've never heard about, uh, the, the building is the mock mine building. Uh, it has been used many times for doing underground mine training, so uh, good facility. But we have all kinds of events, everything from mine rescue training to uh, we uh, hosted the uh, Kentucky Association Convention and, and Visitor Bureaus, which basically is the tourism directors throughout the, uh, the state. Uh, uh, workforce retrainings and training programs. Uh, higher ground comes and practices and does performance. Uh, back in the, uh, I think, uh, in the fall, we had an outdoor performance by, by higher ground in our lower parking lot. By the way, the lower parking also sponsors uh, the, our CDL program, by the way. Uh, we've also had, the, uh, during the election, political debates and introductions of our politicians in the area. Um, uh, we have Santa Claus for the kids that come in here, Easter egg hunts. Uh, also, we have uh, Claire Pope's uh, uh, piano recitals here. So I'm very fortunate to have her bring her group in and, and do her, uh, her recitals. Uh, again, you, if you vote in this part of the uh, county for the uh, in elections, you come here to vote. Uh, Tony Sweat was one of the, uh, the election officers here for a long time. So, uh, uh, you still do that, Tony? I haven't did that in years, last. Yeah, okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, also on the uh, Cumberland campus here, five, we got, uh, you know, essentially five buildings. Our Newman Hall, you know, where the ad building has a lot of the uh, uh, admissions and student services. Uh, uh, we have also our uh, Southeast Scholars, all right. Uh, advancement office. We also have the uh, uh, academic advancement also too. Uh, and a lot of faculty and, and uh, classroom offices there. Uh, Charisma, uh, where our academic affairs is, is housed. The library is housed there. We have uh, adult education. Also we got adult education here on this campus also too. Uh, we also have the uh, workforce uh, solutions. We have a new program that's going to be uh, brought in on, uh, I guess, for the fall with industrial maintenance on the uh, Cumberland campus. We uh, build a facility there and, and, and house some new equipment. Uh, we have the uh, Falkenstein, the second oldest building on the campus there. has a nursing program, the grill, the porch, uh, and so forth. Uh, we have uh, the Godby with our a Appalachian Studies program. Uh, uh, there we have the Black Box Theater our gallery. Uh, we also have a group downstairs in our basement, the uh, GDIT, the General Dynamics, uh, I can't remember what the last part of it is, but they, they, they're they a telemarketing group. Uh, we have our uh, Kentucky Mine Museum. Kentucky Mine Museum houses uh, the uh, museum for mining. Uh, it's been going on for a long time, and, and uh, it's a great place to learn about uh, uh, the mining industry, uh, energy industry, uh, in the past uh, few hundred years, or a hundred years anyway. Annual events, again, we uh, duplicate what we do a lot for Harlan and Middlesboro and, and uh, uh, Whitesburg and Pineville. Uh, we have 
Harlan County Safety Days where they'll have a mine rescue competition, workforce trainings and everywhere. We have ACT testing and also we have Pearson testing, which we also have here too. Uh, political debates, Veterans Day ceremonies on all of our campuses. We also have Veterans uh, uh, Center on each one of our campuses too. Uh, we we uh, celebrate uh, breast cancer awareness, uh, MLK Day, uh, Phi Theta Kappa inductions. Uh, we have natural, 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 National History Day here too. Uh, we, we also sponsor all kinds of different things from the Southeast pageant to Swap and meet to be held in the fall. Uh, higher ground practices all over the place. Uh, uh, East, the golf outing, Easter egg hunts, and so forth. Uh, one of the big things in the Kentucky Mine Museum, we have a festival of trees. And Amanda Hughes does a really good job of, of collecting artificial trees and usually sets up around 150 trees in the building. But uh, our campuses stay very active uh, with not only our faculty and staff, but also the communities in our area, too. So if you have a need uh, for a particular facility, you got a birthday party coming up or uh, something like that, a reunion, uh, come by and see me and we'll see what we can do to help you anyway. So if you have any questions, please contact me. And again, I really appreciate Ryland for putting this on. And again, I'll be singing that song. Thank you. Sean Lid will present on the Whitesburg campus. Uh, Deborah Young is the campus uh, uh, director at there, like Lige. Uh, so you're pushing. Thanks, Ryan. A uh, lot of you forgot to talk about the empty stocking fund, oh, which we you. host on the Cumberland campus. Well, we don't actually host it. The community comes in, and they basically auction off gifts for community members, and then they go and deliver those presents right then and there. It's pretty cool. We broadcast it on our uh, public access channel, yeah, go Dakota. Uh, but um, there's a lot of stuff that uh, is repeated on all of our campuses. But one event that is coming up in August, which is going to be super fun, is open house on every single one of our campus. So check your calendars for the first week of August. Make sure you go to one of our campuses and go to our open house. Food, fun, inflatables, bring your kids, sign up for classes, anything you want. Um, but <coughs> Whitesburg is pretty darn unique. Um, this old building here that is in the picture is probably some Italian stonemason years and years and years ago that laid all that stone. But uh, besides the look of it, it also has this gaming club. So the community comes in, uh, students come in, and faculty come in, and they play board games, they play video games. And one, like, one weekend a year, they have this extra life event, and that raises money for uh, children's hospitals is mainly what they're they're sending their donations to. Uh, but yeah, like next week, the whole campus is going to be filled up with uh, pickers and grinners uh, with the Cowan Creek Mountain Music School. Um, so we're working with the community there, and they're reserving the space and using the space, and uh, yeah, it's just going to be a good time for all of them. Um, HEAL meetings. Um, in Letcher County, there's this group called HEAL, and uh, one of the doctors uh, at the local clinic organized this committee, reserves the space on campus, so it's a network of everyone that's trying to battle uh, addiction, and there's addiction recovery groups, um, economic development groups, job training, transportation, anything that they're trying to fix and solve to make our own community better. And, you know, we're, you know, the college is there. We're trying to, you know, bridge that gap towards employment for them as well. But yeah, the Whitesburg campus is pretty unique. And, uh, yeah, come visit sometime. We're always there. Who's next? <laughs> so, as uh, Dr. Johnson's making her way. So my colleagues, my apologies, uh, community, clearly you can tell we do a lot of stuff. So uh, please take advantage of these opportunities, but for the rest of my colleagues, if we can, uh, we only had 15 minutes scheduled here, we're already past that. So if we can do cliff note versions of everything, that'd be wonderful. But uh, here's Dr. Uh, Rebecca Johnson to talk about the Pineville and Middle School campuses. 
think I'll just skip over all that because, uh, like Sean said, we'll just repeat ourselves if we just keep going over. But um, in my wheelhouse, I have student affairs, and I've been at the college for 27 years. And um, so it's a great interest of mine for you all when you do, we have our open sessions, to really think of what, you have kids, you have grandkids, give us some ideas of what we could do for our students. Um, Sean has mentioned the gaming. We're going to open up the gaming for each of our campus and kind of take out some of the uh, activities they don't do and actually supply TVs and gaming chairs and things like that where they can kind of have game night. So things that, that you all may know that your family do kind of help us and that way it draws interest for us. That way they can come to our campuses and feel like it's home. You know, the kids' camps have been great. They've got to, to be on campus. They, they stay there all week. We uh, had one here on the Harlan campus. We've had it in Middlesbrough. We will be doing it in Whitesburg, but we kind of got flooded out on that this, this summer. So just kind of keep that in mind. Think, you know, what would my kids, my grandkids want, want to happen? But I do want to say that Dr. Adams wants to uh, thank you all for being here. He's kind of had a little incident with his foot and they've got him in a brace, so he can't really walk right now. So he wanted to say thank you all for coming. He wanted to thank Ryan and uh, the whole committee for the hard work that you've done. And I also, now that diversity and inclusion is in my wheelhouse, want to thank you, Ryan, because you and the committee have just done an awesome job. But it's hard for me because our dear Carolyn Sunday, who is one of my dear best friends, um, I, I think she's just looking over on us right now because this committee has just been wonderful. There's a lot of things that she and I talked about through the years that, that we wanted to do. And even when Mo Jones was here, and, and uh, we talked about things that Carolyn had brought up. And it's just amazing to me that Rylan and I can sit and have a conversation and the committee is coming up. And I just feel like Carolyn's speaking to us all over again. So let's just keep her in our mind today while we're here. Um, but like I said, we've got the student groups. I'm the campus director also of Pineville and Middlesbrough. We've got a lot of things that we've got going on uh, on each campus. And so uh, we definitely want you all to come. I will say this about our dual credit. My son got his associate's degree. So you all push your grandchildren and push your children while they're in high school to take courses. Cause that is something that everyone needs to take advantage of. He got his two associate's degrees. He's now moving to Florida to the College of Aviation in Henry Riddle. So good things can happen with these kids that are in school. Idle time is not a good thing. So I think that's about all we've got now, isn't it? Yeah, I think we're good. Erica Farmer, if you could talk very briefly, I know this is a ton of stuff on this, that'd be helpful. And then uh, higher ground folks, you're next. And then I'll just go ahead and uh, do this for time's sake because we're, we're out of it, uh, crew. Uh, come on up, Erica, come on up. Uh, let's chit chat. Um, if you go to our website, it's there, click it. There's a ton of student resources. I wonder if we'll take them to it. Okay. Um, so you can see a list of all the student resources. We're here to help. We got money to help. You just gotta sometimes find it, and that's what we're trying to figure out how to, to make that easier for you all. So here's Erica talking about student services. Um, my boss is here today, Dr. Johnson, and uh, you know, I talked to her. Student services is something that's so dear to my heart because when somebody comes on campus, um, I just want Southeast to feel like home. That's our main thing. and. Uh, I've spoke to y'all a lot, uh, a lot of y'all this morning, and um, so I just want you to feel at home here, and uh, I love all of you all. I, I see so many familiar faces I've not seen in a while, so please encourage your friends, neighbors, family to give Southeast a try. We work, we really try to bring in every resource possible within our community. And we partner with Vocational Rehabilitation, Harlan County Community Action Agency, which all the community action agencies in every, on every campus, I mean on, in every uh, county that we serve, and um, Upward Bound, Southeast Scholar, we partner with Eastern Kentucky University. They have a really good, we have a partnership with them where you can get your bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Lindsay Wilson, you can get your bachelor's degree in human services. Um, 
I wrote some notes here. Academic Advantage, and actually she's here today, Dr. Deborah Hodge. Um, they have a really good program, Upward Bound, Amanda Creech, Southeast Scholar, Jennifer Cornell. And, um, you know, our community partnerships, a lot of times we get students, and I've worked with two actually this morning that come in that are not currently employed. And you know, it's easy for me to say, well, come on out to Southeast and take classes. But students also have to live. Just because you come to college doesn't mean your, your, uh, your bills are going to stop and you've got a family to take care of. So we partner with community partnerships to help people get supplemental services here to help you live and, and, and live comfortably while you're attending college. And so... Um, you know, that's what we strive to do. We have a really good program that uh, we work with for students in recovery. And, and, and Amy Simpson's here, and she just does such a good job of, of uh, promoting uh, these success stories. And we've got a student right now that um, recently got a full-time job at uh, Cameron River Comprehensive Care Center that five years ago she was um, in jail, incarcerated. She was a single mom. She was addicted to uh, drugs. And now she has her child back. She's a full-time employee, has two associate degrees, and a certificate in recovery coach. And that's what we want to do for our community. So uh, I'll keep it brief. But um, it's so good to see everybody. And thank you all for coming. And just reach out to me. I brought a box of my cards here. And uh, if I can't find you help, uh, if, I don't, if I can't help you, I will find you help somewhere. So uh, reach out to me anytime. And again, I, it's an honor to be up here uh, talking to you all and to be on this committee. So thank you. Riley, thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, yes. Cassidy and uh, Ronnie, if you, if you haven't fell asleep on me yet, he was very tired. And Ashley, if you want to come on up too. Uh, we wanted to hire, highlight Higher Ground. Higher Ground is a, as a, as an arts group. I mean, I'm part of it, and this crew is too. But uh, this is totally about community work. So if you can briefly describe what we do at Higher Ground in a very short amount of time, because we got to keep going. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Cassidy Rock. I'm the administrative assistant for the Mellon Grant Program and the Higher Ground Program here at Southeast Community Technical College. Uh, we uh, in Higher Ground, we are focused on community arts and serving our community by using people in our community to tell the stories of our community. We often, as Appalachian people, hear a lot of things through the media and stuff about Appalachians, and we want to tell it from our own perspective. And uh, Higher Ground is all about lifting up every single voice in our community. We uh, have a very strong uh, community leadership and especially with um, with a lot of underserved groups here in our community. So uh, I'm going to let our, uh, <laughs> our community partners, uh, Ronnie and Ashley, tell you about their experience with Hard Ground. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ronnie Walker and I have been with Hard Ground almost since the inception, it's been over 10 years. And we've given what, nine plays? Nine, 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 nine plays. plays. Oh yeah. And so uh, we talk about diversity. And one thing about Higher Ground, you have diversity. It's one of the things you brought all these people together from all over the county. And in our county, you know, you've got many different cultures, many different ideas. And you bring all these people together, you think you're going to have a big bomb and it's going to explode. But Higher Ground has a way of bringing people together with different ideas. We are what you call a living history book. We tell you about the past, we tell you about the present, and the hope for the future. We don't tell you what to do, but we just give you the, the information for it. I love Higher Ground. Higher Ground is important in community place making, using historical events from people's lives and long forgotten groups that have been displaced and bringing them and making them alive again. So people can experience those losses and experience those victories in a true and lasting effect. Higher Ground has touched my life. It has caused me to see people in a different way. It has caused me to be a better person, build stronger relationships, and it's helped break down prejudices that I had been taught as a child. 
It exposed me to people that I never would have thought I would have ever had a relationship with, and it has helped place me in a community where I am loved and accepted, and we love and accept everyone. Thank you guys so much. If you all uh, are interested in joining Higher Ground, you can always reach out to me or Island, and we'll be happy to keep you all in touch. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm going to hand the stage over to Sherry Tinsley. She's going to introduce Dr. Roger Cleveland for our keynote today. Um, it was great to see her and um, 
uh, Buffy and Sam and the folks come uh, support me. So I was going to give some brief comments about uh, Juneteenth. I, uh, when I teach, I don't do a lot of uh, talking in my classes because the, my thought is, is that um, you use the entire knowledge base in the room. And what I mean by that, in the act of teaching, you should be learning. In the act of learning, students should be teaching you. Right? So um, I'm not usually giving like a whole lot of long lectures, so you don't have to worry about that part. But uh, let's just talk about uh, Juneteenth. It is a great time to celebrate uh, Juneteenth, um, to celebrate, educate, and, act, and, and advocate for black history and the black experience. And what I want to do is talk about Juneteenth through the two, three things, examination, education, and participation. So Juneteenth not only celebrates the freedom of African Americans from slavery, but also the time when our achievements are noted and continuous self-development is encouraged. It was especially the case in Texas, where thousands of slaves were not made aware of their freedom until June 19, 1965, when Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston and issued an order officially freeing them. Their celebration would serve as the basis of June 19th, or what we call Juneteenth, a holiday celebrating emancipation in the U.S. Ironically, while Juneteenth has become the most prominent uh, Emancipation Day holiday in the U.S., it commemorates a smaller moment that remains relatively obscure. It doesn't mark the signing of the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation, which technically freed slaves in the rebellion of Confederate states. Nor does it commemorate the December 6, 1865 ratification of the 13th Amendment, which enshrined the end of slavery in the Constitution. Instead, it marks the moment when emancipation finally reached those in the deepest parts of the former Confederacy. Interesting enough, most people in East Tennessee and in Kentucky, we celebrate August 8th, okay, in 1863, because that's when the news came to Appalachia, the Emancipation Proclamation. So we were celebrating this two years before they did in Galveston, Texas. It's interesting, next month I'll be in Galveston, Texas uh, doing a presentation. Uh, so you hear a lot, particularly in Paducah and Western Kentucky, celebrating August 8th. That's the emancipation that we tend to celebrate in Kentucky and East Tennessee. Uh, Juneteenth, uh, after the last couple of years, during the protests, starting in 2020, Juneteenth got a lot of um, you know, notoriety and things like that, but most people in Kentucky and Tennessee celebrated August 18th. So if you ever go to Western Kentucky, that's a big day. But also they celebrated in Lynch, Harlan, Cumberland, and they had big events and things like that. So I, I, I sat down with one of our most prominent historians from Lynch, Kentucky, Dr. William Turner. We're having a conversation about this and make sure I was on the same page. You don't want to throw any kind of history out there about Appalachia and blacks in Appalachia without talking about William Turner. And, uh, and, and so we had a conversation the other day about this and the importance of that. So keep in mind that you may hear Juneteenth, it's a federal holiday, but most Kentuckians tend to celebrate August 8th uh, when their initial emancipation. It is considered that um, the day after Americans in West Kentucky heard about the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, President Abraham Lincoln issued an Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 as presidential order. But it was, uh, wasn't until December 1865 that Congress ratified the 13th Amendment that permanently abolished slavery in the United States. So the original was actually in August 8th uh, in 1863. So in the midst of our celebration, which we all should celebrate, I want to address those three areas that I've mentioned before in pursuit of black excellence. That is examination, assessing the contemporary issues related to the status of African Americans, education, teaching the broader community how learning true history can dictate the future, and educating all children about Juneteenth. This is, African American history is history, okay? All history, whether it's Appalachian history, African American history, Latino history, it is history, okay? It may be talking about a specific group, but it's all about all history. So when we teach our students about that, all students should know about all history, right? Um, and also participation. That's the most important one. 
One, examination, our, raising our consciousness, but the other one is like, what are you going to do afterwards? When I get back on 75, go back to Lexington, and we come back next year, 2023, have we done anything different for this community, uh, for marginalized people? Uh, have you done anything educationally? Have you done anything different other than we'll come back and have this conversation again? So make sure that we participate throughout the year, just not this particular day. So I want to talk about examination, education, participation. So let's look at examination. Examination is what I'll really call critical consciousness. While this holiday is more about commemorating the end of slavery and about past suffering, it has also shaped black life in contemporary times. Whether that be Jim Crow, uh, segregated schools, the rise of mass incarceration, ongoing traumatic experiences that black people have endured, we still can celebrate, okay? And throughout slavery and things like that, if you watch uh, documentaries and things like that, when slavery was going on, even kind of all kinds of different movies, you'll see a lot of people in the plantation and things like that smiling. Now, you know, picking cotton for like 15, 16 hours a day in the heat was not fun, right? And you would see people's hands all the way down where they were bleeding. So why were people smiling? I think Paul Lawrence Dunbar captured it in his poem called we wear the mask. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay with human guile, with torn and bleeding hearts we smile, and a mouthful of subtle ties. Why should the world be otherwise in counting our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us as we wear the mask. We smile, but, O oh, great Christ, our cries to these tortured souls arise. We sing, but the clay is vile. And beneath our feet, as we long the mile, let the world dream otherwise as we wear the mask. What was Paul Lawrence Bar trying to tell us? What was he Dunbar trying to tell us? We wear the mask mostly mainly on the issue of racism faced by many African Americans, like the point itself. Dunbar uses the pronoun we to express the collective sufferings of the black people of his time. He speaks about the plight of the entire black race living in America during that time. He goes on to express the fierce anger concerning the discrimination against them. They are forced to mask their angry emotions with a smile. The poet also goes ahead and recalls how black race cried to Christ for assistance. The rest of the world ignored their cries. They failed to recognize the black people and their struggle for equal rights. Towards the end of the poem, the last line, the poet says, let their efforts towards the struggle yield no results. So it was important that even though you may see certain movies, how they portray slavery and things like that prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, the smile was a way to get through the pain. But underneath that mask was a lot of pain and suffering and things of that nature. But in 2020, due to Breonna Taylor, George Floyd and other issues, and unrest in the United States. Black folks stop wearing a mask. They want to be heard. And many people, white, Latino, Asian, LGBTQ, are out there with black folks, ripping their mask off and letting their voice be heard. Always give people their voice. Every person that's under 18, raise your hand in the room. If you're under 18. All right. My students, we got a few, right? As you move through, as you navigate through your seasons in life, young people, I'll let you know about this. People, you should be always be heard. Your voice should always be heard. If it's about you, without you, then it's not for you. All right? Let me say it again for the people in the back. If it's about you, without you, then it's not for you. We should give our children voice. Okay? In every situation, give them voice. So the examination is very important. We have to have critical consciousness. You know, what do I mean by that? Critical consciousness is a tool that engages marginalized people to question the nature of their historical, political, and social situation. You're questioning where you are at this particular time in life. So consciousness is really important. Harriet Tubman said, I freed over a thousand slaves. I could have freed another thousand if they had known they were slaves. Consciousness. Y'all get that on the way home. 
All right. So as long as the oppressed remain unaware of the causes of their condition, they fatalistically accept their exploitation. Yeah. Critical consciousness. I freed over a thousand slaves. I could freed over another thousand if they had known they were slaves. Critical consciousness. And the experience of African American, and this is not even part of what I had to say, but I just got to touch on it because where I am in the heart of Appalachia. And you'll see some of the same exploitations that African Americans have gone through, you see the same thing in Appalachia. Mm -hmm. I did my dissertation on African American students who are second generation Appalachia, who moved from Eastern Kentucky to the Cincinnati area. And as I was doing my research, I noticed there's a lot of similarities between African American culture and Appalachian culture, okay? And so it can switch real quick, and you'll find yourself in some of the same, same situations. To start these critical conversations about moving black, the black agenda and human rights in general, we must go beyond pontification and protest. Researcher Paula Freer said, research without action is just rhetoric, and action without research is just activism. And many times when people, when the issues came up in 2020, with all the protesting and, and things of that nature and how different people were treated, throughout the country, some people were upset. And so I have a quote, Dr. Sweat, in my office at EKU. And the quote says, ignorance is like sleep. Your initial reaction is to get upset at the person who woke you up. Y'all get it when y'all get home, okay? It must be the mountains. I don't know if y'all can hear me well. Because when somebody introduces some new information to you that causes you some uneasiness, you get upset. Ignorance is like sleep. Your initial reaction is get upset at the person who woke you up. So we got to have critical consciousness. Education is really important. I'm glad we have some students in here. Uh, but we got to have courageous conversations, right? And that comes from leadership. Our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. Who are to be smart, intelligent, excellent? Who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so other people will not feel insecure around you. You are born to make manifest the glory of God is within you. And it's just not in some of us. It's in everyone. And when you let your own light shine, you are unconscious to give other people permission to do the same. And when you're liberated from your own fear, your presence automatically liberates others. So when we lead our children, you will see the oppression and racism, things like that, diminish. Well, we got to lead that. Okay? Critical conscience. Education. For my students, real quickly. Juneteenth is more than a, an observance of freedom. It's also a time to share experiences of those who fought literally and figuratively to seek freedom for future generations. It's important that we don't whitewash their, our history. The common mistake about those who teach history in American slavery is the center, the, put the center in the U.S. government, the role of granting freedom while also placing the onus to navigate through society solely on formerly slave. In other words, the focus needs to be on those experiences, not necessarily about the Emancipation Proclamation, but talk about why there was a reason for the Emancipation Proclamation, yeah. right? And understand when the Emancipation Proclamation was declared by President Lincoln, that was only for the South. So there were slaves in Delaware and other places like that in the North. So not only did he, he do that, but it was also a political strategy to hurt the Confederacy. It just went out of the goodness, goodness of his heart, okay? Even though that's what we're taught sometimes. Perhaps the main center, uh, but it's important for students to know that enslaved people didn't willfully accept enslavement or wait for others to free them. They resisted often and consistently while rare violent rebellions did occur. Some people successfully escaped enslavement. In everyday acts of resistance, such breaking tools, pretending to be ill, or other ways to enslave people asserted the humanity. It's important that we learn about uh, Juneteenth and all our history. Education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Right. As I said before, you know, Ms. Williams, you know, the, the way she taught content and brought you into that. You know, that's a skill I learned from years ago. 
but students need to see themselves in the curriculum, right? They need to see themselves in the instruction. They need to see themselves in the classroom. And you know, have to enable us have pride in themselves. So we have examination, assessing our contemporary issues for African Americans, education, teaching everyone, okay? This is history. It just has to be about black folks, okay? This is history. Teaching everyone about Juneteenth and African American history. And for that part, Appalachian history. And the last one is participation. What are we going to do after we leave? We have some good barbecues, some good singing. We know everything about Southeast Community Technical College now. You know? <laughs> so maybe you want to go to school. I'll go back to school, go back to Southeast. Uh, you know, and, and so I got some folks in Middlesbrough who are like, why aren't you enrolled in Southeast? You know, that's a good opportunity. And, and, and so the education part, the participation part. Real quickly, some things you can do real quickly the, to advocate and participate in uh, the uplifting of African American people in this region, but people in general in this region. Okay? One, uh, higher ground, just talked about it. Bring in local activists, have plays, musical events that displays real history, though about this and so you know an uh, organization like Higher Ground is something that's people that can actually teach history through music and drama and things of that nature. That's something you can do. If you can't sing like I can't, if you can't act like I can't, I can at least show up, right? That's part of the issue. We're talking about Juneteenth is supposed to be important, the federal holiday, look at the auditorium. I know they market it and promote it all over the region in Southeast Kentucky, but so even if you can't sing, speak, Hey, you can participate, right? Do this, all right, I promise to do this. I pro it won't be painful. Practice the ministry of presence. Just show up. The ministry of presence, just show up. Um, anybody that's in our schools, in our school districts nearby, southeast, other places, make sure that People of color represented accurately and respectively in the curriculum. We can do that, right? Um, we can have uh, Juneteenth celebrations, which we're doing today. Challenge yourself to learn more, which is education. Uh, the campus, Southeast, create systemic plans to put in place that addresses diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, right? We don't want performative work, we want transformative work, okay? Performative is we're just doing it because KCTC has said we had to do it. Transformative is mean we're going to do it because we're out of commitment, not compliance. All right? All right. All right. I'm borderline fussing. Let me get back. All right. <laughs> Educate ourselves. Have courageous conversations. Everybody don't know everything, right? And it's okay if you don't know everything. That's fine. Use your power. Question where you plug your power in. Do all those things. But it starts with each individual person. And so as young as our people here, the young ones here, and those who are a little more seasoned, we all have a role to promote uh, African American history, uh, promote all people in this region, respectively. So it starts with each individual person. And the only way I can best sum it up is this way. My best Middlesbrough way is this. Out of the night that covers me black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my uncomfortable soul. Within the fellow clutch circumstances, I've now winced or cried aloud. Under the blessed chance, my head is bloodied, but unbowed. Beyond this place in rapid tears looms the horrors of the shade, and yet the minutes of the year shall find, shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate or I charge the punishment of scroll, for I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. So today, celebrating Juneteenth is a great opportunity to do something for someone else they cannot do for themselves, right? But remember this, the opportunity of lifetime only lasts during the lifetime of that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cleveland. Um, 
we're going to move into our community discussion. I know some people may be anxious about this, but we want to hear from you. We would definitely want to hear from you. So if uh, Dr. Tony Sweat, uh, Sam Coleman, Sherry Tinsley, and Mo Jones, if you'll make your way to the stage, I want to help rearrange the stage a little bit here. So, uh, so again, I'd like to, to welcome uh, the panel here. And, uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Cleveland, for being our uh, master of ceremonies uh, through this um, uh, uh, community discussion. Um, uh, what's, how this is going to go is Dr. Cleveland's going to um, uh, throw some ideas out there, and he may address them to the panel, and the panel may have some responses, but he may also address it to, to the community at large. Um, and so uh, as the discussion evolves, if you feel like you would like to speak out about anything in the audience, uh, you can just, uh, it's a small auditorium, you can speak up. Uh, but if we can't hear you, I'll walk beside you and uh, hand you this mic here. So without further ado, I'm just going to hand over everything. Tony, if you'll move over a little bit. Uh, Sam, if you'll scoot over just a tad bit this way, we'll get you all visible. Let's go this way, Sam. Remember that when I went to that. Let's go this, this way. <laughs> okay, which way do you want me to go? <laughs> there we go, there we go, there we go. All right, so... Uh, Tony, Tony, you're going to stay here. There we go. Got dancing cats. But, uh, all righty. So, uh, without further ado. All right. Well, we're situated now. Can you hear me okay? Well, um, first, let's just let uh, our folks up here um, just uh, introduce, introduce themselves and just quickly what, you, what your role is in this area. I love Harlan County and I miss Harlan County. I wouldn't be the woman that I am today if I had not have come here. So I'm very thankful. Um, I am the director of advising at Southeast and I'm also an adjunct instructor and I'm on the committee with the diversity team and my husband's a pastor in Barberville so I work with lots and lots of young people, uh, preferably African American children that I love dearly. And so they got me into education as well because of some of the situation and issues that they were facing uh, in their homes and their communities. And so I hear a lot about this all the time. Good afternoon. Yeah, afternoon. My name is Mo Jones. I am originally from Georgia. Um, I started my career working in higher ed for about 12 years. I've been working in higher ed. I just migrated into K through 12 where I'm partnering with the Kentucky Department of Education with uh, about nine of us, eight of us in the different regions where we're focusing on working with K through 12 with uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. And so we're going through the lens of curriculum, hiring, um, uncomfortable, courageous conversations. And I'm just thankful for being in this space um, as a student growing up in Georgia, which is maybe towards the peak of Appalachia, like down at the bottom part of it, but we have Appalachia Mountains where I was growing up. And a lot of resources and the support systems that I see and I needed as a student, it wasn't there. And so the way that I decided to fix that was incorporate myself into the school system and advocate for me. Um, a poem that I think about is, who's gonna cry for the little boy? And that is my mindset with the work that I do. Somebody has to cry for us. And if it means that I have to cry for myself, I'm willing to cry for myself. And so I'm making sure that I can advocate and have representation. Um, it's like mirrors and windows. I think not only is it important for people to see themselves reflection like in the mirror, but I think it's also important for other individuals that may not identify with um, <clears throat> a diverse group or a marginalized group that they learn from those individuals so they can have a window to see the world through. And so that is my goal. All right, thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Dr. Tony Sweat, uh, born and raised here in Harlan uh, County, graduate of Southeast. Uh, I'm currently managing director of Appalachian uh, Post-Secondary Initiative at uh, Teach for America, Appalachia. 
and uh, I'm changing jobs this year, and I'm hopeful to work closely with South Ace and some of the other uh, K-12 and, and colleges and universities within the region. So I am looking forward to being back home and working with the folks I love. Thanks, sir. Okay, my name is Samuel Ray Coleman, Jr. I am Betty and Sam's baby boy. <laughs> maybe two minutes tops, your best elevator speech to respond to the question, okay? Uh, but you all are here for your expertise uh, in your different uh, fields, but the, really the voice we want to hear is out there. Uh, so you all will support and answer some of the questions they have out there. And this whole idea is about community engagement and how do you support um, African-American uh, students, the African-American community, and the broader community in general, our, our marginalized people, uh, and we say this region, truly Southeast Kentucky, 
truly Appalachian. North Georgia doesn't count, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you want a bus now. Uh, thank you. But it's only if you live for 40 years in Appalachia, you got at least, right? You're not from here, right? This is like 40 years, and then we can question that. But uh, so the question I want to pose to you all, and then I want to pose it out to uh, the audience, because so many people came and spoke about Southeast. They shared a lot of things, a lot of services they have, right? And so we heard some of those things. Um, on top of that, what is, and I'll start with you, Sherry, what is some of the greatest needs you think are in the, in the region for African American, the African American community and the broader community? What are some of the greatest needs? Or whether it's educational, health-wise, economically, whatever, from your perspective. Um, from my perspective, I think that, because where I get to work with a lot of young people um, at our church quite a bit, um, I think they need a lot more encouragement. Um, they don't get a lot from their homes. A lot of the children that I work with are raised by their grandparents. And um, their parents are on the streets strung out. They'll say, oh yeah, that's my mom, she's a druggie. You know, and, and it's hard to change their mindset. So I try my best to encourage the young people to get an education. I told them, you know, I wasn't handed a silver spoon and neither will they be. And I always encourage them, make something of yourself. And so that's the biggest thing is to be that voice. And a lot of the reasons I did go back to school so they could see that and that they could achieve what I have achieved. So, paraphrasing, you're saying one of the greatest needs is superior, encouraging them and supporting them? Yes. Okay. And modeling for them, right? Yes. Okay, great. And here's the other thing about this. As they respond to this, we're not asking the Southeast Community Technical College to solve the problems today, right? So told them to get home before dark. Um, so we're not asking. We want them to listen, right? Anytime you take a leadership role, we tell people to Listen, learn, then lead. So we're not asking the, the college to solve any problems and things like that, but they need to listen from this group and those folks out there. So Mo, what do you think is one of the greatest needs in this region? I know you haven't been here long, but just from your perspective. I would say more opportunities to access. Just access. Um, I'm looking at it from the standpoint of when I compare uh, college students to some of the students that I've met here. Um, and if they're coming from different areas, so such as Louisville. There are some experiences in Louisville that students in this area may not necessarily have just due to transportation, due to social economic status, due to how the area is set up. So if we can start creating more pathways um, and more access opportunities for those students, then I think we'll see um, I think the outcome will change. I always say that uh, exposure is the best classroom, the experience is the best teacher. And the more you expose people, students, and things like that, as you said, opportunities are important. Brother Sam, what's one of the greatest needs you think in this region for um, African -American, uh, the African American community and the community as a whole? I thought that the greatest of this community was the, the family. Did 
Anytime I ask someone to do anything, I know that he was a Marine and he was only 18 years old, I guarantee you he did it and he did it well. Okay? And sometimes that meant going in harm's way. And I never had one not go. Now I'm preaching. <laughs> Dr. Sweat? Uh, I, I think it's a, a, a disconnect between uh, positive role models and, and the younger generation. You mentioned exposure. Uh, you know, if I never see that positive person in my life, then what, who am I going to emulate? So, so I need to have access to positive role models. And, and that sort of allows me to know that I too can achieve that. So I think it's a lack of ac access to positive role models and a disconnect between the older generation and the younger generation. We have to find a way to become engaged with these young folks. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <clears throat> I do a lot of training for teachers and aspiring teachers at EKU, and I tell them all the time that, you know, with our current generation, you can't use landline phones with smartphone kids, right? So you got to be able to connect with them, right? And it's hard to be what you can't see, right? So before I ask them another question, the folks out there, Ryland has the mic. Remember, we're not solving the problems, okay? We just identify needs. What do you think are some of the greatest needs in this region for uh, the, Af the dwindling African American community uh, in Appalachia and the larger community in general, whether you're white, black, whoever? What are some of the greatest needs? Anyone want to share with your 90 minute, 90 second response? <laughs> uh, they probably can hear me, Ryland. I'm speaking. I usually holler pretty good. Uh, I think that the community at large, different. The different businesses um, need to give all children, but definitely children of color, an opportunity for a job to work, um, just opportunity to get into the workforce. And because most of our children, they're not, when I go places, I don't see my children, I call them my children, but I don't see African American children working in a lot of places. Uh, the hospital needs to hire more. Uh, the college could hire more. I mean, all these places, the school systems could hire more. We need to see more people of different ethnicities in all of the businesses around this area. They need to be given that opportunity for a position to work, to learn, to be mentored by workers, to go into different careers. I just don't see that. Okay, so we need some more representation. Yes. Correct? Okay, and access as and that's the interesting thing because uh, we have a program in Lexington, I think Sherry mentioned in my bio, called BMW Academy. And it's for African American males. We used to go 6th grade to 12th grade. Now it's kindergarten to 12th grade. And uh, one of the biggest things is constantly putting them out there and preparing them. And so they, they go to school all around the world, all around the country. But even in the Commonwealth, the last six years, we've been pushing a lot of our students to Bluegrass Community Technical College because the assumption was you didn't go to a four-year school, you weren't successful. Four-year school is not ready for everyone. It's not for everyone, right? And, and so there are opportunities at Southeast, but after they take advantage of Southeast, we need to open the doors and get them access once they get those certificates and degrees and things like that. So you partner to create more opportunities. Someone else in, uh, in the audience. What are some other great needs? Do we have one other? When Dr. Johnson uh, approached student services and wanted us to come up with summer camp, I thought, oh God, what am I going to do, you know? And <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get a summer camp together. And, and so um, we, we, we've got a summer camp. We're in week three. And we've had several teachers say, Erica, uh, the, the students that are problematic at school, they've blown their minds. We just can't believe it. They have just soaked all of this up. And one of the first days that I, I had the students, I noticed they all had phones. Well, I figured they were not allowed to at school, but, you know, I wanted them to know that we encourage technology here. 
So the very first thing I said, get your phones out. Well, of course, they were all trying to hide them. Like, I don't have time. <laughs> I said, no, seriously, get them out. And I wrote, Southeast Kentucky Community Technical College and SKCTC president on, on, our, on our board. And I said, I want you all to get your phones out. And I want you to go to Facebook. And I want you to like these two pages right here on Facebook. And I want you to follow, follow our president page and follow our Southeast page because we've got a lot of neat things going on here. And, um, and we turned technology into a good thing. And so the, the principal at one of the schools, he said, uh, well, how's the TikTok team going? You know, you've got trouble for me. I said, oh, he's doing great because we encourage, we, we, we turn that into a positive thing. And one thing, and Dr. Johnson, I want to say that I'm so thankful for this summer camp because it has brought kids here that, and just like you said, we, we, we want to start young and open our doors up to these kids and let them know they are soaking up these programs, HVAC, to carpentry, uh, computerized machining, and the, which our professors are so wonderful, but it's hands-on, and the students are absolutely loving it. And we're encouraging them that we want you here at Southeast, and we've got these programs here. So I, I'm so thankful that um, for our summer camps, but you're so right, opening our doors up to these young children and letting them know that we want them here. You know, we've got programs here that, that you're going to be interested in and can grow in and can get a really good job and a career. And I've heard back from the parents, they're posting on social media that their kids are loving it. So that, and that's what, that's what it's all about. Well, while Ryan's getting over to our next person, the uh, <clears throat> I'm glad you mentioned the summer camps. I hope they're all all campuses, and I'll be more concerned. I'm selfish because I'm from Middlesbrough, but um, the camps are so important, particularly recently because of the pandemic. We already had a summer slide in general before the pandemic, so we really have one now. So, uh, really promote the camps and, and get as many children as possible. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Edward Zaner. I'm new to Harlan. I uh, recently returned from teaching as a professor at Thailand's What I Left University in the southern part of that country. And I think I saw something there that helps address what the moderator just said uh, a few minutes ago, which is the need to hire your graduates. And one thing that university did was they had a trimester system, much like what you may have developed here, I heard. And um, the reason they did that is because during the next to last term of the senior year, each student would do a full term internship in a local business. And uh, you guys are better positioned to supply trained students in the right fields than that one was. It was a liberal arts school. And, um, uh, and, I, and what I really noticed is that I'd say at least 50% of those internships turned directly into jobs. And something like that would be happening here someday. That's what you're asking. All right, thank you. All right, grow your own, right? All right, all right, Bell County. Good, good evening. Um, I would just say one of the biggest problems I see is that there's no programming for the students. I'm talking about like uh, like a YMCA, boys and girls clubs, things like that. We talk about the students all the time when they get addicted to drugs or they're out in the street. They're committing crimes and they're doing things. But what, what do we have for them? In Millsboro, we have a swimming pool that just opened after what, three years. We have a skating ring, which all kids can afford. But that's it. If we could put as much effort as we put into sports, into our children, because if you play a sport, oh my gosh, I mean, you're at the top and it's so much. I mean, you. They will do, I mean, we even got people doing bingo to raise money for sports. But we don't raise money to help our kids. So we need more programming to help our students. And we need to open our doors to our older students. A lot of times we want to do so much for elementary kids, but we forget about our middle and our high school students. Okay. I absolutely don't need that.
Pose one more question. Yeah, it does. But well, I have something for you. Is it Cheryl, Miss Cheryl? Sure. Miss Shirley? I'll say to you the same thing I tell my students every Saturday at BMW. If you operate within your gift, you don't have to sit at the head of the table. Because no matter where you sit or stand, the table will shift. They're going to need you at some point in time, right? Okay. Exactly. My question for the panel, we're going to wrap this up. I already had that, that side eye from Ryan. Ryan. So, uh, and I'll start with uh, Dr. Sweat, and then you all can follow suit. What is the connection to Juneteenth uh, celebration and contemporary issues for African Americans, uh, particularly in the Appalachian area? So what is their connection or relationship between those two, from your perspective? so long, our history has been muted. I mean, I went through K-12 and even college, and, you know, we, we know Martin Luther King, uh, we know uh, Harriet Tubman, but we don't know W.E.B. Uh, Carter G. Woodson. I was a grown man before I, I realized his brilliance and that, that he was uh, from Appalachia. So it's like, give us something to be proud of, too. Let us know that we've made a contribution to this great nation. So don't hide it, share it, divide it. So let us know that we have contributed uh, to this great nation also. Juneteenth is fairly new to me. And so I, I don't feel like I should be a grown man just learning this stuff with a college degree and our young folks don't know so. Okay. Same question for Mo. Uh, the connection between Juneteenth, celebration of Juneteenth, and contemporary issues for African Americans, uh, particularly in the Appalachian region. Um, I, I think I would use the symbolism of how long it took to get the message. Like, the, you think about it, you get the message. I mean, they were free a lot longer and a lot sooner than they got that message. And so, I think what it what it plays in, right, is, and I look at the psychological piece with our students, um, the world is trying to tell us that we can't do things. 
they're constantly telling us that we can't do things, even based upon how things are set up and structured. And so if we believe it, right, we'll still stay bound when we're free. And so that same symbolism is, is how I look at it. And I know that's, that's a bit lofty, I'm a Philly type of person, but if you really think about that, it is I'm telling the students something that they are that they don't believe that they are. And so every time I'm seeing a student, I'm just encouraging them something that I see in them. And the reason that I see it in them, because I have a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging. And I see differences as strengths. And so the more that we shift that lens of what we see in society, right? Because society tells us that this is what's happening, this is what's going on, people aren't getting along. But in the community here, we can feel the difference. The fact that we can kind of embrace, like when I was here and being able to just connect with anyone, I felt like I was family because I would meet someone that reminded me of my grandmother and I would instantly feel like this was my grandma speaking to me. So the more we have these uncomfortable conversations, I feel that the more we realize what we really are and how close we really are to making change. If we continue to look outside and not internally, then we were going to be just as blind as they were, knowing that they were supposed to be free until somebody told them that they were free. So I hope that kind of made sense. You were like two seconds from the elevator, so I, I felt it. I felt it. I have a buzzer right here. Yeah. I felt it. I was about to buzz. Yeah, <laughs> elevator speech, Juneteenth, contemporary issues elevator. now. Cat. I think Juneteenth is just the, the edge of the iceberg. Since my retirement, I've become a history buff. Uh, how many people in this room know that a person of color and a woman of color came through the Cumberland Gap with Daniel Boone? And as you might know, I'm very proud to be a Marine, but in 1776, when they started the Marine Corps, there were two black men there. And I didn't know that after I retired from the Marine Corps. Uh, we have a rich history here. Okay? And Juneteenth is just a tip of it. Yeah. There were black uh, Union soldiers guarding the Cumberland Gap and all those other things that were going on. And Dr. Bell, one of the, the he was the principal of Lent, or Lincoln, one of the first black men <coughs> with a degree in the United States. Uh, we were very, we are a very diverse group. We have Jewish and, and uh, Lebanese communities and stuff in these hills. And, and if you're going to teach history, teach all the history. Tell me all about it. And we go. Hey, I've been thrown out of the place. <laughs> Thanks, sir. And definitely not last but not least, Sherry. Um, I was raised in an era that um, I lived in a community. Uh, everybody was white. I was the only, my, my family was the only black family in my little neck of the woods. And I didn't really think about history. I wasn't taught history, African American history. And Juneteenth, it's new to me. I mean, I've never heard of it. I know it's a paid holiday, and I get, I get paid to stay home Monday. <laughs> but I've had to learn this, and, and as I get older, I'm beginning to see things in a different light. And sad to say, I've had to learn the black culture because I was raised in a, in a white environment, and I would just accept things because this is the way it was supposed to be, and I never questioned anything. So I'm at the point in my life now that I think Mo said it, couple of times today, I've always been seen but never heard. And I think that having celebrations like this, having openness like this, this is opening up a door for us not to be afraid to speak and to be able to know that we are appreciated. We are somebody. Just because we're black doesn't mean that we're not special. And we're smart. And we are intelligent. Look at all of us up here and people out there. We have we have overcome a lot of hurdles. I would have never in my life dreamed that I would have a master's degree. I was never smart enough, but look what happened. And I'm proud of my mother if she was alive today. 
she would look down from heaven and say, I'm proud of you, baby girl, because you've done something that my family was never able to do. I'm the first black person in my family to graduate with a college degree, not to mention a master's degree. So I thank God for Southeast for making these doors happen for me. Thank you. Thank you. As I, as I wrap up, and uh, I think Rod, I'm done for today, right? I think. Uh, but since you gave me the mic, uh, and I am the guest, I'm going to finish it off. Because uh, Sherry just said something that's really important, and it is important that uh, African American children, white children, whoever, who, who grow up in the mountains, uh, they have to really uh, see people like this, right? And so uh, I had nine brothers and sisters, right? Grew up in um, Middlesbrough. Started in Cincinnati, we all grew up in Middlesbrough. And none of, I'm, I'm a first generation college graduate. Now I'm probably the least smartest out of those 10, okay? And it goes back to access and things like that, but I'll never forget this, and I'll say this to kids, every time I come back to the mountains, I say this to kids all the time. i never forget, we were standing on the porch one time, and, and somebody was going to the movies or whatever, and we had no money. We were poor, we couldn't afford the OR. Uh, <laughs> man, y'all slow, but anyway. <laughs> But anyway, so we're still on the porch. They walk by. It's like, y'all want to go to the movies, right? Well, we have any money. So I had a brother named Mel, and he was like, man, I'm tired of being poor. So my mother comes out, and she hears me say this. And she said, what are, you, what are you whining about? He's like, we're always poor. We can't do anything. We can't buy stuff, da 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 And my mother said this. She said, we are not poor. We are broke. And we're like, what's the difference? And she said, poor is permanent. Broke is temporary. It's a mindset. Right. I took that from about the second grade, and I remember that as a mindset. So just like Sherry and Mo and Sweat and Sam, we leave the mountains. Sometimes we don't think we can. But people plant that seed. Because there's no way this guy should be sitting here with a doctorate degree. But we're the smartest one from Middlesbrough. So we got to instill our children, no matter where you come from. But you got to understand this. We have to show love and support of them. A child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down until it's warm. And I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you all. Thank you all. I'm going to blind you for a second, Dr. Cleveland. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Maybe. This is going back on. You go for them. Yeah. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Deontay uh, Hallowell from Spalding University down. Um, make your way up on the stage. Sorry, I'm not the, the lip of this here. But, um, um, Tony said, I have a great friend uh, from Louisville, and I'd love for him to speak at this event. Um, and, you know, I'm going to let you speak for yourself uh, as we go through here, but um, I know you're, you're very active in the, the, the urban area of Kentucky, Louisville, uh, and community activism, and um, uh, collaborating and, and uh, uh, community work. And if you could just uh, enlighten us a little bit about your work that you do up there, but also maybe what you heard today and give us some uh, charges to move it forward. Because, you know, like Dr. Uh, Dr. Cleveland says, it's, uh, we got we're, we got to be present, we're here. Now how do we move forward, you know? Uh, please make your way up on stage. I don't want you to sit down here. I'll stand right here, I'm good. Uh, happy Juneteenth to everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to just say uh, thank you to Dr. Sweat. Oh, did he leave? Back there. Okay, but he's the, the person that invited me to come here. I met him through his cousin, uh, Dr. Cicely. Uh, she just changed her last name, but she's from here too. And uh, she's my colleague at Spalding University. But I'll introduce myself first. I'm Dr. Deontay Hollowell, and I was born in Paducah, Kentucky. I was raised in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Hoptown is what we call it. Have you heard of it? Oh, you went to K-State? Okay. And then, I, uh, yeah, the uh, president was from there. 
And then uh, I went to school at, uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, University of Louisville. And so I've been around the state uh, pretty much all my life, uh, one way or another. I went to grad school in, in Philadelphia for a couple of years, but then I came back. And uh, I worked with a, a powerful group of people that some of us went to University of Louisville together, and others of us migrated to Louisville from other parts of the state, or you know, I'm from Louisville. And uh, probably for the last seven or eight years, we've just been working really hard to try to organize, specifically, uh, black people who are working on behalf of black communities throughout the state. So we started off in Paducah, and then we went to Hopkinsville, and then we went to Elizabethtown and Radcliffe. Of course, we do work in Louisville, and now uh, I'm here, and what I'm hoping to accomplish here, and, or throughout the whole state, is to uh, create a database of information that black people and whites and others can have access to, so when they do travel throughout the state, they can have somewhere to go. They can uh, patronize a black business. They can uh, run into people who are engaged in social activism on behalf of black communities. And so I hear a lot of people uh, today that spoke talking about unity and understanding and opportunities and those things. So that's pretty much what, uh, what the work that we're doing right now is. So I'm hoping to come back to Harlem real soon to uh, put on a workshop uh, in that same vein to have uh, black business owners or teachers, uh, daycare workers, whatever, people who are engaged in the lives of our people so we can come together and figure out how to do this together. And I know that uh, people from Appalachia may not feel that, uh, like I'm from the southwest part of Kentucky, but some of the same things that I see out here are also going on um, in my neck of the woods down in Hopkinsville and Purdue. So I think we probably have more commonalities than differences. We should uh, land on what we call that narrow strip of unity and really organize based on our likenesses and uh, not focus on our differences. So I thank Dr. Sweat for inviting me here today. Um, I have a group of people that I work with and we don't have a name or we're not, we're organized but we're not an organization because it works a whole lot more smooth when everybody's just kind of doing uh, the work out of the passion for getting it done. So thank you guys for giving me a minute. I thoroughly enjoyed myself here today and I look forward to coming back. Thank you. Sam, I need your help. So we're, if y'all will turn your program to the back there, we're all going to sing uh, the Black National Anthem today, Lift Every Voice and Sing.
The work is just beginning, so please partner with your local diversity groups here. Thank you all so much.